by the power of the Holy Spirit as we listen this morning. Amen. So reading from Psalm 122. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. There stand the thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. Thank you, Elaine. And yeah, if you want to keep your Bibles or phones open at Psalm 122, that would be really great to, to stay in that together. Um, and yes, there are, as ever, there are questions she's to help with. Um, so we're just going to look at yeah, Pete, and do you want to maybe split that with someone else? So yeah, just put your hand up. It's a sheet that helps you just follow along the sermon. One side are questions for this particular sermon. The other side is space to doodle and take notes and to reflect on what God might be saying to you through his words. <clears throat> so just let those pass out for a moment. So we're in Psalm 122. Now, when the journey is hard, you need to know that the destination will be worth it. It's that time of year when many people are going to go away on summer holidays in the next few weeks. And in the weeks ahead, for some of us, there will be lots of packing to do, plenty of long journeys in hot, sweaty cars, maybe getting up early to catch a flight, um, arguing families, or maybe that's just my family, uh, traffic jams, um, yeah, it actually, bizarrely, holiday can be quite stressful. And when the journey to get somewhere feels like tough going, you need to be confident that all the effort you're going to will be worth it. You need to remind yourself why you're taking that journey and that the destination, the end point, is going to be something really special. And I believe that's a large part of the message of Psalm 122 for us all today. This is a song of future hope that celebrates the future hope and future home of God's traveling people. It's a song to be sung by people still on a journey towards that future hope, that future home, and it keeps them going on that journey. It's like the rest of the songs of a sense, this songbook of 15 Psalms within the book of Psalms we're looking at. This song would have first been sung by Jewish pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem. Their destination, verse 1, is the house of the Lord, the temple in Jerusalem. If David wrote this psalm, as, as the title says, this would actually be the tabernacle just before the temple is built. But either the temple or the tabernacle, this was the place where the living God promised to meet with his people. The place where the sins of God's people could be forgiven and dealt with through sacrifice. The place where God's people could celebrate God's rescue together and worship him for his grace. And this particular psalm, Psalm 122, it celebrates the pilgrim's first glimpse of Jerusalem, their first glimpse of their destination. Now, it's widely agreed that the songs of ascents were meant to be sung sequentially. That means they're one after the other. This is only the third song in the sequence of 15. So the pilgrims are actually still some distance away from Jerusalem. But verse 2, they feel like they are almost there. Verse 2, our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. There's a real sense of excitement, of joyful anticipation here. These pilgrims are cheering one another on. We can see Jerusalem ahead of us. We know we're getting closer. You can almost smell it. And so the pilgrims sing this song together to remind one another on their journey that every step, Every blister, every sacrifice, every moment of struggle will be worth it when they get there, when they get to Jerusalem. We're almost there. I think probably any group of people walking somewhere needs someone who's a bit of a blind optimist and very cheerful. Come on, we're going to get there. But this is a song of hope 
We're almost there. Our feet are almost at the city. Keep going. Keep traveling. Why? Well, because the rest of the psalm tells us Jerusalem is the home these pilgrims are longing for. It's the home God has prepared for them. And for everyone who puts their faith in him, for everyone who makes the journey there in dependence on his grace and strength. And if that's what the psalm meant for its original Jewish audience, what does this psalm mean for Christians reading it today? Well, in the New Testament, our understanding of who God's people are expands dramatically beyond the borders of ancient Israel and the Jewish people. And as a result, Jerusalem comes to signify something far greater than the ancient capital of ancient Israel. Jerusalem comes to symbolize the church brought together by Jesus and also the new creation won for us by Jesus. Jerusalem is both the church and the new creation. There's some examples there on the screen. Galatians 4, 26, Paul refers to the Jerusalem that is above, referring to the church made up of Jewish and Gentile believers. Or Revelation 21, verse 2, John sees a vision of the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. So Christians, when we see Jerusalem, we see in the New Testament, that refers to both the people of God here and now, and the people of God as we will be in the new creation. It refers to what the church is today, but also what the church will be in the future. So actually, this psalm, it's, it's both, if you like, a celebration of the future, and it's also a prayer for the present. It's a song that celebrates where we're headed, our future hope, our future home in the new creation, and it asks us to respond to that future hope by asking God to change us here and now so we reflect that future home in our lives together now. In many ways, a New Testament equivalent of this psalm, you can find it in the letter to the Colossians, Paul letter, Paul's letter to the Christians in Colossae in chapter 3, where Paul writes this. He says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. I want to suggest this psalm, Psalm 122, it's here to help us set our hearts on things above, to remember where we're headed, and to urge us to live out our future identity here and now in dependence on the God who leads us and who loves us. So let's walk through the psalm together now and see what it means for us. I hope you can actually see when it was just read out for us. It's, this song is a really properly communal celebration. It's a song sung by a worshiping community, gathered together by God to worship Him as they travel together. And we're going to see um, just about three headings in this psalm. We travel together, the psalm shows us, to the New Jerusalem. We spur one another on towards the New Jerusalem. And then we pray for our life together to reflect the New Jerusalem. That's sort of where the psalm takes us. First of all, then, we travel together to the New Jerusalem. Again, it's clearly the song of a worshiping community. It's, it's, a, it's a plural psalm, if you like. like. Both the previous songs in the Songs of Ascent, Psalm 120, Psalm 121, have, have emphasized rightly the individual decision a believer makes to begin the journey of faith. So Psalm 120, if you here, was a couple of weeks ago, is all about repentance, about turning away from this fallen world and heading towards God. And then Psalm 121 is about faith. It's about trusting God for the journey. But Psalm 122, it is a corporate song. Believers get to sing together. And it reminds us of the part every single believer has to play in spurring other people on in the Christian faith as they themselves are spurred on by others. I mean, look at verse 1 for a second here where the psalm begins. Because what's striking actually about the opening verse is that the speaker kind of admits that his decision to go to Jerusalem, it wasn't actually his decision initially. He was actually invited to make the journey by other pilgrims. So verse 1, he says, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It wasn't the speaker's idea. He only made that decision when he was invited to by others. 
I don't say even at the beginning of the psalm, this is a beautiful picture, actually, of the role the church has in evangelism, in proclaiming the good news of Jesus to the people around us. Now, again, because if you're, if you're a Christian here this morning, I want you to think for a moment, who were the people who first told you about Jesus? Who were the people who first invited you to follow Jesus? Could be a parent, could be a relative, a friend, a work colleague, a school friend. So I want to say in in that moment, that person was kind of paraphrasing verse 1 of this psalm. Whenever someone invites someone else to, to hear about Jesus and put their faith in Jesus, what they're really saying is, let us go to the house of the Lord together. See, they're inviting you to join them on the Christian journey. They're inviting you to join them on the same road they are walking, the way of Jesus, the way of trusting Jesus as Lord and rescuer. It's an invitation. It's not something you do on your own. You should trust in Jesus. Bye, I'm, I'm leaving. It's actually, you should trust in Jesus. Let's, let's do that together. Let's travel this road together. We're inviting people to trust in Jesus and become part of his people, also known as the church. Let us go to the house of the Lord together. That's at the heart of evangelism. But actually, it's also at the heart of why we meet together like this week by week as a church family. Because none of us was ever meant to walk the Christian journey alone. We need one another. Again, the New Testament talks about one of the key things we do for one another as a church in Hebrews is to encourage one another daily for the journey ahead. Encourage, that literally means to give the other person courage, to strengthen them. And, and that is why this group of travelers or pilgrims, they're, they're, they're traveling together and they're singing this song together. And listen to the joyful anticipation here. Verse 2, our feet are standing in your gates. They're not there yet, but they're going, actually, we're almost there. We can see more of Jerusalem. The more we learn of Jesus, the more we learn of what he's done for us, this new creation, this new Jerusalem, is becoming more real for us. That is why we sing songs of praise together. Not because everything's great in this world or because we're all really happy and doing well. So much of worship is we're anticipating the end of the story. We're going, actually, this might not feel real now, but it is true. It is real. And we do that together as we sing and spend time together. Actually, it's an amazing reality that I asked who here was a Christian already, but actually every other Christian in this room, if you're a believer, they are a glimpse of the new creation. They're a glimpse of of our future hope. They remind us that our God is a God who saves people. He didn't just save you. He saved you into a community of his people. Again, the New Testament, the book of 2 Corinthians says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Every local church is an outpost of the new creation in this world. Every single believer is a miracle of God's saving grace. If you doubt that God saves, if you doubt that God's really there, he's doing things, actually gathering together with other believers and seeing them put one foot in front of the other, sometimes joyfully, sometimes in a struggle, that is a sign to us. The new creation has come and it is coming. That's one of the great gifts of belonging to a local church like Avenue. We get to say to one another, let us go to the house of the Lord together. And we are forgetful people. And we get overwhelmed by things in this world. But every week, when we travel alongside each other, we're reminding one another, God is near. Jesus is alive. The Spirit is in you. The gospel is true. And the new creation is coming. That's quite a lot to remember. But actually, there's versions of that we're saying to each other all the time. You know, God is near. Jesus, he is alive. You have the Holy Spirit in you. The gospel is true. And the new creation is coming. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. We are on our way. I need you to remind me of that week by week, day by day. And you need me to remind you of that too. Let us go to the house of the Lord together. It's a journey 
we travel together. The new creation's coming. It's actually here in part by just the very reality that the church gathering here today. We're not home yet, but we get to spur one another on in the journey. That's the middle section of this psalm. We spur one another on towards the new Jerusalem. Again, it's worth saying, why is Jerusalem such a big deal for these Jewish pilgrims in Psalm 122? Is this just sort of blind patriotism? It's going, yeah, it's our capital city. It's great. Well, actually, there's several reasons why Jerusalem was so precious to these pilgrims. It's a secure city. that They'll be safe there. Their enemies couldn't get at them behind its walls. They'd be surrounded by fellow pilgrims there. Remember Psalm 120, this guy's on his own, surrounded by people who hate God, and he wants to be in Jerusalem. But the overarching reason why Jerusalem is precious is because the Lord is there, and we get to worship him there. Look at verse 4 with me here. that, That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord to praise the name of the Lord. Jerusalem is precious to these pilgrims because actually it's the place where finally we will get to do what we're created to do, to worship the Lord in the way he deserves and the way that brings us joy and life. Because worshiping the God who made us, it's what we were made for. And we get to do that in community with his church from across the world and across the ages in the new Jerusalem that is coming. Again, you don't need me to to tell you that we live in a world where human community is complicated and it's difficult. We're living in a world of dramatic political change. Again, we've mentioned the general election in our own country. There are elections going on in France. India saw some really dramatic results recently. We've got the U.S. presidential election later this year, whatever happens there. We are living through a time of of fragmentation and division and anxiety. We don't quite know, no one can predict what might happen in the world in the coming months or years. And as Christians, we are saddened by that. We, we grieve that. But also, if we're reading our Bibles, we're not surprised by that. Because God's clear, we're not home yet. We're still in the middle of the journey, the middle of the story. We live in a world that's fallen and marred by sin, and we will experience feelings that this just doesn't feel right. Homesickness. We want to be in the world that works. And we're not there yet. But Psalm 122 reminds us a better world is coming. Thanks to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. A new creation's coming, a new Jerusalem, a world free from sin and suffering and death. And it will be worth waiting for. And this psalm gives us some some sweeping, broad strokes as to what that world's going to be like. What will the new Jerusalem be like? It's a place of wholeness, verse 3. Look at verse 3 here again. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. The word there means sort of joined up or well put together. It's a city that works. Things just work in that place where people thrive, just things, things fit together. And in my, in my grumpy middle age stage, sometimes when sort of a bit of technology is working, why can't you just work the car? Why can't you just work, you know, DIY? Why, why did that fall down? Help me in that. But actually here, it's, it's a world that works. That's where we're headed, this psalm tells us. A place of wholeness where people thrive place of community, verse 4. We've already looked at that verse, but this is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. It's a place where God's people, the whole people of God, gather together to worship God when Jesus returns. We will experience unity and togetherness in ways that we cannot ever experience here and now. But notice actually, unity doesn't mean uniformity. It doesn't mean everyone's the same. We don't all look the same or sound the same in this new Jerusalem. The psalm is clear. This is made up of the tribes, plural, of the Lord, with each tribe retaining its individuality even as it becomes part of the whole. I was trying to think. It's kind of a bit like watching England in the football last night. I'm not English, but, but bear with me. And kind of you've got this team. They're made up. Yeah, they're sort of, there's, there's West Ham occasionally. Did, didn't play, but you know, West Ham do get represented. You've got like sort of Man City. You've got Liverpool. You've got... Brentford, I think. You've got other teams. 
But they stand for those teams, but actually they come together and they're wearing the shirt and they're representing their country together. They don't stop that individual allegiance when they come together for that corporate allegiance. Here, the tribes of the Lord, they don't stop being those tribes, but they unite to worship the Lord. Sometimes when I was a kid, I was scared heaven just meant everyone would just be look the same, obliterate all differences. We're all wearing shining white robes, much like the England football strip. And as an Irishman, that terrified me. Um, but no, we think, oh, it just be all the same. We'll all look the same. Well, no, we will not all look the same, but we will be united to worship the Lord. Revelation paints it beautifully, this vision of the new creation, the Apostle John. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they cried in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It is going to be gloriously diverse in the new creation. That's the diversity we want to see and pray for here and now. But it's going to be amazing. We're going to hear music from different cultures that just, they're just better than ours. We're maybe going to eat food from different cultures that's maybe better than ours or at least different. We're going to enjoy time together as God's people united in worship of him. Because that's what we're made to do. We're made to worship him. That's the, the other picture we get here of the New Jerusalem. It's a place of worship, verse 4. Again, we ask the question sometimes, maybe on a bad day, we just, we've got some time to go, why am I here? What am I here to do? What's the purpose of my life? This psalm tells us the purpose of our lives is to worship the living God. With the person you are, with whatever opportunities you have, that is why you're here, to know him, to love him, and to worship him. Again, look at verse 4 again. Why do the tribes of the Lord gather in New Jerusalem just to enjoy time together, to enjoy unity, enjoy, enjoy safety? Those are all good things. But the reason they're there, the psalmist says, is to praise the name of the Lord, to give thanks to the God who has saved them and led them and kept them and welcomed them to be home with him forever. And that's going to be an amazing day, the psalmist says. Our feet are standing in your gates. Keep going. That day is going to be glorious. Our purpose in life is to know God, enjoy God, and make him known to the people around us as we worship. Again, this new Jerusalem, it's going to be amazing for so many reasons. We get in Revelation, it's free from sin and suffering and shame and death. But what will make heaven heaven is that God is there. And he welcomes us. And we get to see him finally face to face. And we finally understand just how deeply he has loved us all along. How glorious his purposes were for us. What he went through to win us. As he wipes every tear from our eyes, we realize he was with us all along. God will be there. That is what makes New Jerusalem remarkable. And because God's there, it's going to be a place of justice. That's verse 5. Verse 5 says, There stand the thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Again, judgment, when we think about judgment, that's often something frightening um, for, for us in, in, in the Bible. It often means our God is a God who judges. That, that, that's, that's scary. But actually here, it is just good news for God's people. For every follower of Jesus, God's judgment is good news. Because it tells us there will be justice one day. That evil will be punished. Wrong things will be put right. The faithful will be rewarded. Everything sad is going to come untrue one day. There will be justice. And that's what we long for. I think this, this community are singing this song about Jerusalem to remind themselves, here is where we're headed. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Keep going. It's a place of wholeness, a place of community, a place of worship, a place of justice. It's the place you were made for. The writer C.S. Lewis puts it like this. He says, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. That's what the gospel says. We're made for a better world. But every time it just doesn't feel right, every time you see injustice and you go, that's wrong. It tells you you're made for a world of justice a world of worship, 
You're made for the new Jerusalem. And because of Jesus, life, death, and resurrection, you can go there as you trust in him, as you put your life in his hands and live by faith in him. And how do we respond to this? This glorious picture of our future home. Well, actually, the last bit of the psalm kind of gives us a response. We might not think. I, I kind of would be happy to end the psalm in verse 5. Great, lovely ending. I'm heading there. Brilliant. But actually, the psalmist says we can actually pray. Pray for our life together now to reflect the new Jerusalem then. So if every local church is an outpost of the new creation, then actually the psalmist says pray for the peace of Jerusalem, he says. It's a, it's a celebration of the future, but also it's a prayer for the present. Let me read from verse 6 again. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. Now, we're not being asked there to pray for the new creation because that's secure, that's safe, kept in heaven for us by Jesus. I'm actually not being asked to pray for the present day city of Jerusalem though we should be praying for that troubled part of the world as we would for any part of the world. I believe this is a prayer for the church here and now, the people of God today. But actually this glorious picture we've seen up to verse 5 would begin to be reflected in our life together. And why do we need to pray for that? Because it doesn't come naturally to us. We're not naturally worshipping people. We're not naturally people who can unite together. We're not naturally whole people, actually. Many of us are just broken. We're all broken in different ways. So we need to pray for the reality of where we are headed to reflect our lives now. Set your hearts on things above, says the New Testament. It is really easy to look at the church, any church, and just see the flaws. And then just to give up or to go cynical. Because people in churches let each other down all the time. I let people down. People let me down. That's part and parcel of the church in a fallen world. But this psalm is here again to remind us, don't give up. Look where you're going and then pray that your life together will reflect the reality of where you're going. In particular, he just gives us two headings for the prayer. He goes, pray for peace, pray for prosperity. They're even alliterative in our language. Pray for peace. That's the Hebrew word shalom. It's one of the richest words in Hebrew. Hard to totally define, but the best way, I think, is to, it's about the presence of God. Pray that the church here and now would know the presence of God, that the living God would be central to our life together because it's only as we rely on him we will bear fruit we will begin to reflect the life of the new jerusalem and pray for prosperity that could be translated what is good or what is best and it's not primarily actually money or material wealth it's actually just a sense of security that ability to rest in the lord's hands and we live by faith, not by sight. It's easy just to be overwhelmed by things, but actually pray for prosperity for the church, that we would rest in God's hands. We would follow him. We would trust him. We need the presence of God and the peace of God in our life together. At any time. And in this particular season of our life together too. We, we say sometimes at family meetings, I think we are still walking through a season of change as a church here at Avenue. It was only back in January, actually, that we planted Ayers Monsal Community Church on the Ayers Monsal. It's only six months ago. feels maybe longer for some of us. That church is growing. We're going to be praying more about it in the months to come. Praise God for what's happening there. But we sent people away to do that. We're adjusting to a smaller staff team and, and eldership. We've, we've said goodbye to some people. We've welcomed new people into the life of the church. This week, we're, we're relaunching our home groups. A really big deal, actually. We need the Lord to give us his peace and his presence in this. We need him to lead us through this time. So just looking at this psalm this week, I'm just going, actually, can we all commit to pray for our life and mission together? Will you pray for the elders, for Joe, our woman's worker? Will you pray for the new home group leaders? Will you pray for one another? 
that we will know the presence of God and that our life together will begin to reflect more and more that glorious destination we are all headed to and that God is leading us to. We're going to see in a few weeks' time another song of ascent, Psalm 127, begins with these words. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. We need to pray for the church. Our destination is actually secure because of Jesus. But that's not enough for God. And it shouldn't be enough for us. He wants actually that future destination to shape our lives and our relationships together here and now. This is a song. It's a celebration of the future. It's a prayer for the present. It's, it's a song we need to sing together, saying we are almost there. Keep going. Keep walking. The destination will be worth it. In the meantime, we get to travel together. We get to spur each other on. And we get to pray, playing our part in God transforming our life together to be more and more like that new Jerusalem that we are all longing for. Just the opening verses of this psalm again. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Let's pray together. Let's, let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you that this psalm reminds us just how deeply you love your people. You love the church. Thank you that your glorious purposes are to rescue us from lives that ignored you and rejected you. So Lord, each believer here was invited by someone else and your spirit worked through that invitation to draw them into your people. Thank you that you love us. And thank you that our future destination will be glorious in the new creation. Thank you that it'll be worth every step, every struggle, every sacrifice when we see you face to face and we worship you as we were made to do. Father, we confess that the church today is not what it should be globally, locally, here at Avenue. That we are a flawed community far from reflecting your character. So Lord, we want to pray. We pray that you would be at work among us, loving us, leading us, and making us more like Jesus. We ask you to lead us through this time of change at Avenue, in particular for our new home groups launching in the autumn, that we will know your care and leading in it all. And Lord, above all, we ask you to help us reflect more and more the character of Jesus and the character of the new creation in the ways we love you, love one another, and love our world. It's amazing to think we are an outpost of the new creation. That feels beyond us, Lord. It is beyond us, but it's not beyond what you can do through us. So use our life together to proclaim your character to this world. And keep us depending on your strength as we travel. We ask that in Jesus' precious name. Amen.